Welcome once again to Lato's Law. Here's Steve Lato. I got a fascinating note from an attorney named Ross. And Ross said, Steve, check out this article. Because the article is online in a variety of places that have uh, things posted by attorneys about courtroom experiences. And he goes, and this happened in Michigan. And it's written by the attorney who was in court and, and saw this all go down. And actually, he's the guy who engineered what happened. So it's a fascinating story. And uh, it has to do with a smoking gun document being introduced in court. And everybody who's ever been a litigator, including people like me, have always wanted to have that one document when you got the key witness on the stand and you could say, well, let's talk about this, shall we? And you start cross-examining them and you watch them turn different colors and start sweating and shaking. And then, of course... On television, they would then break down and go, I admit it, I admit it. But it never happens in real life, or at least seemingly never happens. So here's a story by Michael C. Taylor, who's an attorney. He wrote this story, and the headline that he gave it is Font Choice. Font Choice exposes fabricated document. So the suggestion here is that his opponent came into court and said, I've got the document, Your Honor. This is the one that makes the case. There you go. And then looks over at him, Michael C. Taylor, and goes, now let's see what happens. And of course, it turns out that it was a fabricated document. So a probate judge in Michigan has dismissed a man's claim against his parents for breach of contract, unjust enrichment, and conversion after ruling that a business record he attempted to admit at trial was typed in a font that did not exist when it was allegedly produced. And this is one of the funniest things of all time, is so many people are used to the idea, go to a computer, type something up, and hit print, and it'll print it out. And they forget that that's not how printed documents looked 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 50 years ago. And so can you reproduce the appearance of an old document? Sometimes. But trained eyes will spot it. But here, the person who created the document didn't catch the fact that they were using a font, which is common now, but was not invented yet. Because there's actually people, by the way, who design fonts, font designers. So <laughs> the man sued his mother and the estate of his late father in 2021 over a dispute involving a payment that he made on behalf of his parents. Now, Contested probate proceedings often do pit family members against each other, but what made this case from Michigan unique was an evidentiary ruling. So the case was in court, and the plaintiff alleged that in the year 2000, the year 2000, he alleged that he loaned $110,000 to his parents, and it was a loan at 3% compounded interest to pay off the mortgage on their home. The payment was made from a company under the son's control. According to the son, repayment of the loan with interest was due upon the sale of the home. And the mother did acknowledge that she received the benefit of the payment, but denied that she or her husband ever agreed to the repayment terms. So the father died in 2019. And in 2021, the son discovered that his mother had sold the home in November of 2020 and demanded immediate repayment of the $110,000 principal, interest of over $100,000, and treble damages due to the conversion of the money that he says he should have gotten. In total, he requested more than $600,000 in damages against his mother and his father's estate. So it's against his mother, who's still around, and against his father's estate. So the wife said that the payment was initially made as a gift, and they never agreed to repayment. It was a gift. However, the mother conceded that sometime after the payment was complete, the son insisted on repayment. The father reluctantly agreed and said, we'll treat it as a loan, and it'll get paid back upon the death of both of us, mother and father. So all parties agreed during litigation that there was no written agreement. So the entire case is going to hinge on the credibility of the son who says, I lent them money. And the mother saying, he told us it was a gift. 
And of course, the father can't testify because he's passed away. So this is a conundrum. And this happens all the time in courts where there are two people who are testifying to the exact opposite of each other and there's no other corroborating evidence. Okay? So son says, I lent them the money. They agreed to pay it back. Mother says, he told us it was a gift. Okay? So while they're going through the litigation and the discovery, the defendant said, do you have a written document, a written instrument to show evidence of this loan you made? And they said, no, we do not have one. During discovery, the son did not produce or identify any written evidence supporting his claims. However, three days before trial, he produced a corporate resolution from the company that he ran, dated December 13th, 2000, that he said he had just found in his records. I just found this. It's 23 years old, obvious. That's why I forgot about it, that kind of thing. If admitted into evidence, the resolution supported his allegations and would lend credibility to his claims. So he comes in with a corporate resolution, apparently documenting the fact that the corporation, because of the son, had lent the money. It was a loan, according to the resolution. But defense counsel noticed something peculiar. The nearly 23-year-old resolution which was not produced in discovery and only presented on the eve of trial, appeared to be drafted in Calibri, Calibri, which is an extremely common font now. Use of Calibri is ubiquitous now, good use of that word. Uh, And the mother's counsel questioned whether it was available for public use in the year 2000. As most attorneys and users of Microsoft Office's suite of products already know, When opening Microsoft Word for the first time, the application is preloaded with default settings. Among the default settings is font, type size, and margin spacing. According to the New York Times, Calibri was introduced first in the year 2007. It did not exist in the year 2000. It dethroned Times New Roman as Word's default font, where it has remained ever since. Times New Roman is what I draft a lot of my documents in. But Calibri, for instance, is, I know, the font that's used in my email program. So I'm familiar with it. Now, the font was created by a Dutch type designer, Lucas de Groot, in 2004. So it didn't exist prior to 2004 and was not available in Microsoft Word until 2007. So needless to say, a document created in the year 2000 could not have been typed in Calibri font. So two days before trial, the mother's attorney and his paralegal recreated the resolution word for word using Microsoft Word's current default settings. What resulted was a document whose font, spacing, and sentence justification aligned nearly perfectly with the son's newly discovered but 23-year-old corporate resolution. Trial was had on February 16th, 2023 at trial. The son attempted to introduce a copy of the corporate resolution as a smoking gun during voir dire from the mother's attorney. The son testified that he drafted the document himself in December 2000 and maintained it in his corporate records ever since. He even recited the computer and printer model that he allegedly used to produce it more than 22 years ago. Now, voir dire in this setting has nothing to do with a jury. Uh, Jury questioning is referred to as voir dire. And that's where you are questioned about things to see if you're suitable to sit on a jury. Voir dire also can be used as a term to describe when you're quizzing a witness about something before a court makes a ruling on it. So let's suppose somebody stands and goes, Your Honor, I've got this smoking gun document right here. And the other side goes, Your Honor, we haven't, we haven't seen the document because they didn't produce it during discovery. So outside of the presence of of the jury, or sometimes in the presence of the jury, depending on what they're talking about. The judge might say, okay, I'm going to let the other side voir dire the witness. So you can ask all about it to try to get the bottom of some of these things. And so they're going to ask a bunch of questions about it to see whether or not it ought to be admissible. And so apparently the attorney started poking questions at him, saying things like, when was this drafted? Where has it been all these years? Why didn't you produce it during discovery? And by the way, there is an argument to be made that it shouldn't be admissible at all simply because it wasn't produced during discovery. 
But three days before trial, they can say, well, we gave it to them. And if they want an adjournment, that's one thing. But obviously, you know, but there is an issue there. But the bigger issue is the font it was in and how it was formatted. Defense counsel objected to the admission of the corporate resolution as a fraudulent document that was, in fact, drafted and signed by the Sun within days or weeks of trial, not 22 years ago as he testified, without the benefit of time to hire a document expert because you could have brought in an expert and had the expert look at it and give an opinion. But, of course, you've got to list your experts a long time ago, and so they wouldn't have listed such an expert. Now, a court would probably let them bring in an expert, but on such short notice, and of course, that's one of the reasons that smoking gun documents often turn up at the last second. Counsel asked the court to take judicial notice of a federal case from California where a similar issue was raised. The court there acknowledged that the Calibri font was created in 2004 and not released until 2007, disproving the authenticity of a similar record. So they found a court case in another state where a judge dug into this and came to the conclusion that the font didn't exist in that time frame. And so judicial notice is where you ask the court to recognize something and then tell the jury or if the judge is making decisions at bench trial to take that into consideration. So for instance, I could ask a court to take judicial notice that April Fool's Day of this year was on a Saturday. I don't have to introduce a calendar into evidence and bring in a calendar expert. The judge can look at the calendar and go, yeah, I'll take judicial notice of that. And it's usually over stuff like that that everybody understands. But this is an unusual way of going about it. But by asking the court to take judicial notice of that fact, if the court takes judicial notice of that fact, there goes that document. So... In this case, the judge took a short recess to compare the corporate resolution to the exemplar prepared by the defense team using words default 11-point Calibri font and margin settings. Held up together to the light, such as this, the old and new documents were identical duplicates with the font, spacing, and last word of every sentence matching perfectly. The judge denied admission of the exhibit and ruled that the corporate resolution was drafted in Calibri, which did not exist at the time that the witness claimed he drafted it. Now, you might say, but Steve, that puts us back to square one. So, okay, so they don't have the document. That's where they were before. Oh, no, there's another problem here. I mentioned credibility of witnesses, didn't I, earlier? You see, that's all the judge has got to go on. Which side's telling the truth? So one side gets up there and testifies from memory. The other side gets up and testifies, but also says, I've got this document, which turns out to be forged. Now, who is the judge going to believe? So the only witnesses to testify at the trial were the son and the mother, each with their own version of events. And without any documentary evidence of the nature of the payment, this was a case that hinged on the credibility of the parties. At the conclusion of the proofs, the judge ruled from the bench, finding that the mother's testimony was credible, whereas the son's testimony was not. In a Shakespearean twist, the son had been hoisted with his own petard. The corporate resolution was a smoking gun, but not as the son anticipated. His credibility vanished along with any hope of recovering that money. Court ruled that an agreement existed on the terms described by the mother, that no repayment on the loan was currently due, and dismissed all claims in the complaint with prejudice. This case is over. The son's attempt to deceive the court by introducing an old document using a new font is a cautionary tale to lawyers and clients alike. Lawyers should be reminded not to accept everything our clients produce at face value, especially when self-serving records appear out of thin air (laughs) three days before trial. And clients should be forewarned against fabricating evidence But if they do fabricate documents and testify to their authenticity under oath, they would be wise to confirm that the font they use existed at the time the document was allegedly produced. And so that is the thing. So Michael C. Taylor, who wrote this, uh, is an attorney in Michigan. He represented the mother and the estate of the father. He never imagined that his disdain for the Calibri font (laughs) could be put to such beneficial use for his clients. So it's a great story 
And like I said, and Michael Taylor is the one who wrote the article. Uh, like I said, you know, everyone dreams of finding a document like that. And I've known of a few stories that involve things that popped up, you know, in, in a case where somebody goes, whoa, <laughs> that's going to be fun to bring to court. Um, uh, I don't want to go too far afield in this video, so I'm not going to get heavily into those. But um, you can imagine, like I said, where three days before trial, the other side goes, look, we've got this. It proves our case entirely. And you go, where, where was it all this time? You didn't produce it during discovery. And your first thought as an attorney is, they're producing it so late, we can probably get the court to keep it out. But maybe not, because the court might say, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to adjourn the trial to give you some time to react to this, figure out what's going on here. And so if that document had been real, whole different ball game. And what if the document fell into a gray area where you're not sure? What if the guy had used a font that was available back then? A judge may have said, well, gee, I kind of got to go by this because it, it looks legit. But one thing you got to understand is that when you go into court, all evidence in court, for the most part, has got to be introduced through a witness. Someone's got to testify to get a piece of evidence in. So let's suppose that you want to get these into evidence. Someone's got to get on the stand to get them into evidence. And so someone's got to get on the stand and say, you know, and I would approach them and I would possibly hand these to them. And then I would lay the foundation and ask questions about, do you know what these are? What are they? How do you know that? And then assuming that I can lay the proper foundation for it and the relevance is obvious, then I would move their admission and the other side would have an opportunity to voir dire the witness, ask their own questions. And if the judge sees how they might be relevant, the judge then says, well, that'll be admitted as plaintiff's exhibit, whatever. But this is an unusual situation in this trial because it's a two witness trial. Plaintiff puts in his case by putting the witness on the stand who is the plaintiff. That's it. Defense cross-examines the plaintiff, and then the defendant gets in the stand, puts in their case, plaintiff's attorney cross-examines the defendant. That's the entire case. That's the entire case. So somebody's got to get in the stand. Obviously, here, if you've got one witness, all your evidence is coming in through that one witness. Parties can stipulate to enter evidence if there's no need to go through the rigmarole of entering it if need be. But generally speaking, it's got to come in through a witness. So here's the oddity, and that is, does the guy face any potential liability for having done this if, in fact, he did do anything untoward. And I do not know if he did anything untoward here. He might not have. He might have found this document laying around. Somebody else may have created it. Who knows? We don't know these things. But that is, of course, the real question. So how did this happen? But this is the interesting result. So Michael C. Taylor is an attorney who I salute. The case took place out in Macomb County. Macomb County, a building I've been in many, many times, Macomb County Circuit Court. Uh, it's right there by the river, Mount Clemens. But Font's Choice exposes fabricated document. Ross, thanks for sending it to me. I love the story. Questions or comments, put them below. Let's talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching Lato's Law. Life is a question, and how we live it is our answer.